when I started working in the September, it was the first November, it was the first Thanksgiving that I had ever been away from home on Thanksgiving. We, he would almost, he missed a few Thanksgivings. He never missed a Christmas. You know, he's always home for Christmas, but a few Thanksgivings we missed. But this was the first time he and I were both gone. So I was feeling kind of low. We were up in Seattle and uh, staying at some hotel right there below the Space Needle. And they had a ch Chinese restaurant in the downstairs. And, uh, you know, I was down there by myself and just eating and, and feeling, you know, it was Thanksgiving Day. And I was just thinking, man, you know, here I am in a Chinese restaurant eating, you know, on Thanksgiving Day eating some kind of Chinese turkey. And, uh, or what I think was turkey. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, anyway, you know, I, I was about halfway through, you know, and, and there was a, there was a, you know, there was boots with a, with a planter up on one side, you know, and it's about this high up over the, over the table. So I couldn't see over the other side and I kept hearing, you know, and, and, uh, and I thought, what, you know, and it sounded like two people were fighting there after a while, you know, two, two Chinese people were fighting and I, and I, the next thing I knew, Danny was <laughs> like that, you know, so it kind of cheered me up, I guess, but uh, uh, he was always, I mean, everybody here probably has had some, some kind of prank pulled on him, but, 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 you know, if somebody pulled one on him, he was just, he was just as gracious with it. I think he enjoyed having one pulled on him as much as anything, you know, so, but uh, that's the way he was, though. I mean, he, he, uh, he just, uh, just loved, you know, just being around people. I think that's what, what uh, was most special to see him on stage was that it wasn't it wasn't an act. I mean, he was when he was on stage, he was there because he loved those people, and uh, he was going to do everything he could to entertain them. And he gave the world some of the greatest music that the world will ever know. Yeah, he. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we uh, were talking about that a little while. His, you know, we're talking about the influence that Gene Autry had on him. But his his granddad uh, was an actual Texas Ranger. I found this out. He had, he used to tell me he thought his granddad was a Texas Ranger, but he never knew for sure. Uh, his granddad had told him he was. His name was Texas Bob Heckle, and he was like, uh, we got a picture of him with. He's got long hair down to his shoulders and the mustache. He looks just like Buffalo Bill. That that kind of look, you know. And uh, the first time Daddy brought this picture home. Uh, or, or he brought it actually to the office. I thought it was actually Daddy. He had, he'd been out to the West Coast, and I thought he had made himself up to look like this because the guy looked exactly like him, and his eyes and his, his nose and everything. It's out at the museum out at Opryland now. But Texas Bob was a, a Texas Ranger. He was a cattle man. He was, he was a courier during the Civil War. But, but uh, I don't know for sure. He, uh, I know, but I, I found an article on him in the Texas Ranger Museum in Waco, and... Uh, I think probably in the probably in the seventies. I think he was a Texas Ranger, but uh, and I don't think he was for very long. But he was. But he had, uh, among everything else, he had written a couple books of poems, and they were actually in the Arizona State Museum. We found them in the Arizona State Museum several years back. And reading through it, looking through it, a lot of his phrasing and everything is so much like you know what I'd see in some of Daddy's Western songs, and it, it's so incredible to look at because I know you know he had to have inherited that because he used to sing. Uh, Sunday school songs for his grandfather and in exchange his grandfather would tell him stories so I know that's where he got that first that first love for for, for the West you know because I you know this guy was such a colorful character and such a good inspiration to him Bobby Lord's got an old Marty Robbins song he wants to share with us that I recorded incidentally how many people in this room recorded a Marty Robbins song I recorded a Ronnie Robbins song. Oh, Ronnie Robbins. Oh, okay. That's close enough. That's close enough. All right. Uh, hit me an E there, uh, Mr. Katz. Mm -hmm. We're traveling down two different roads in worlds so far apart. You want me yet there's something else before me in your heart. You wanting me Change my life the way you live your own. Oh, but either take me like I am, or I'll go on alone. I either say you want my love, or take the way you live. Remember, though, before you get, you've got to learn to give. So if it's changed my life or go, then go it's gonna be. Cause I can't change my life when you want something more than me. Worlds 
so far apart You want me yet there's something else before me in your heart You wanting me to change my life Where you live your own But I can't change my life And I'll go on alone Yeah That was Marty's theme song at the Opry for a long time. Yeah, it was. Remember, he used to sign on and sign off with that. Georgette Jones, daughter of Tammy Wynette and George Jones, we've already found out that you're not uh, a professional entertainer, but I didn't know until a minute ago, you don't even live in Nashville now. No, I live in Alexander City. It's about an hour southeast of Birmingham. In Alabama. Mm -hmm. Mama was from Alabama, right? Right. I mean, she was born in Mississippi, but right on the state line, so five minutes from Alabama, and she kind of lived in both places, so she claims Alabama's home, too. But you do sing. Do you do mama's songs, daddy's songs, your own songs? Um, I do kind of a variety of things. I like um, Patti Loveless and Pam Tillis and a bunch of other people. I like to sing a lot of different things, but I do some of mom's and um, one or two of daddy's, not that many. So. Once he sung them, they've pretty well been sung, haven't they? Right. right. <laughs> of course, the same could be said for Tammy as well. Can you do apartment number nine? I will. And as a matter of fact, the one reason why I picked that one was because Mom had told me that um, when that was pitched to her to do it by Billy Sherrill, that she was very nervous because she said, well, you know, my dad had just done it a couple of months earlier. And um, she said, there's no way I'm going to do a song that he's done. So he had to talk her into it, and it ended up being um, one of her um, first big hits. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, Mom and Dad both did it, so maybe we can make it three. All so. right. <laughs> Just follow the stairway to this lonely world of mine. You'll find me waiting here in apartment number nine. Not so very long ago. In this lonely room Just in case you change your mind You'll find me waiting here In apartment number nine Loneliness surrounds That's very, very good. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Johnny Paycheck wrote that, by the way. Dad sang Apartment Number 9, and he had done it just a couple of months before Mom, um, they had pitched this song for her to do. Oh, I see. Right, and she just, she thought there's no way I could ever sing that song after he has sang it. There's, it's not going to do anything. If he did it and it didn't do anything, me doing it is not going to do oh, anything. I got She you. was okay. very... So she just was um, worried about doing it and it, no one wanting to hear that, that they just wanted to hear the Georgia Jones version, you know. And it actually didn't do that well for Daddy, and it did very well for Mom. Yeah, so. sure did. Didn't Bobby Austin yeah. record? I think he had the original Bobby record, had the original. didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He had the original, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think he did. Of course, all of us were so saddened, and, and there was such a, a void left in our lives when, when your mom passed away. What, what are some of your special memories of uh, Tammy Wynette being your mama? Well, I had um, mentioned about how much she likes to cook um, earlier, and um, I can remember not really appreciating, you know, that. I think everybody's mom is the best cook in the world. I don't know if everybody thinks that. No, mine. But, um, <laughs> but um, I grew up, you know, just mom always, you know, special occasions, always did things special for us. And I had been talking to you um, at the break, and he had asked if I could cook um, chicken and dumplings like my mom could, and I said, no, her sticking her thumb in it for some reason made it taste that much better. <laughs> But um, I remembered one time um, when I couldn't be home for Thanksgiving, and um, I, I always went home for the holidays, but for, the, for um, this Thanksgiving I could not. I had been sick, and um, so I was at home um, four hours away, and I guess she must have felt sorry for me and knew how much I wanted to eat some of her cooking for Thanksgiving. And she got a huge styrofoam box. I mean, it was huge and probably this deep. And she um, had cooked, I know it had to have been cooking for days, and um, froze all of it and then put it on dry ice and shipped it to me. And so we, I took it all out and heated all that up for Thanksgiving for our family at home. And then we had food to eat on us for three or four months. <laughs> we had, I mean, we didn't, I mean, when we finally got the last pack out, I remember my husband, at the, you know, he looked at me and he said, that's the last pack. Maybe we should save it a little bit longer and we'll get it and cook it later. But As a young girl, as a teenager, were there... Were there problems being Tammy Wynette and George Jones's daughter? I think the thing that my sisters and I talk about the most is that you absolutely have no identity. I mean, I'm not Georgette. You go anywhere and you meet people and you're always introduced as or you're pointed out as, oh, look, there's Georgia Jones and Tammy Wynette's daughter or there's whatever. But you're never, hey, here's Georgette or Tina or whoever. And, you know, there's... But, there's a lot of benefits to it. Everybody knows that's the truth. I mean, I got to travel a lot, and, you know, I got to sing and do a lot of things. I mean, even like this today, I'd never get to do if it hadn't been, you know, for my mom and dad. And so there's a, a lot of wonderful things that, that came out of it, more wonderful than the bad things, good. more good things than bad. So. Good. A lot of people in this room were close to Tammy. Jan, I know you and Tammy were very close friends. I guess she was probably one of the closest friends. And... Um, uh, we were there, we shared a lot of good times, and we went through some bad times together. She was there with me, I know, in, in a lot of my bad times. And, uh, but we had a lot of laughs, and uh, at a time, I was there when Georgette was born. So, but uh, uh, there was a time when I said, you know, I'm, I'm quitting because of something that had happened in my life. And uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't go on the road by myself, period. And, uh, and Tammy came over one day and she says, we're going to Europe. I want you to come and go. And I said, I don't want to go. I'm not going to sing, period. She said, I don't have to sing. I just need a buddy. I just need my buddy with me. And uh, so anyway, she said, we're just going to be gone two weeks and, and it'll be fun. So, uh, so I did. And, uh, and. And eventually, she got me to sing, like, one song. And she was so gracious uh, because I was, you know, I, I stayed, tried to stay in the, in the back as far as I could get because I just didn't want to be up there. And, uh, and then I, when she finally did, and, and I was singing something, and I could see the, the fans in the audience, and I, I could see them say, that's Jan Howard, that's Jerry's Jan Howard. And she, before, while she was introducing me, she said, yes, that's, that's Jan Howard, that's my buddy. She said, and I'm going to sing, but you have to uh, know she's going to sing, and, and then you have, to, you have to put up with me, and then Jan will sing, whatever. You know, and uh, she was very gracious about it. Well, it ended up that I, I, I stayed with Tammy for about a year. And uh, we had we had a great time, and 
and it didn't bother me at all to be what some people considered, okay, to go back and, and be a backup singer. I, I didn't consider that. I was with my friends. And and if they hadn't, and if I hadn't been with them, I wouldn't have done it at all. So it, it finally gave me the confidence enough to go back and, and, and do it by myself. And, and, um, t and Tammy and I both talked and cried the day I decided that I had to leave. And she said, you're right, but I'll miss my buddy. And uh, I now miss my buddy. Do one of her songs. Very much. Wow, I don't know if I can, but <clears throat> Georgette, I recorded this in an album. In fact, I recorded uh, three or four of her songs in albums, but I have never sung them since that day, since I recorded them in the studio. Because like you said, when, when Tammy, when, they, when she sang them, they had been sung. And so I just never did, and this is the first time that I've ever tried to sing this song. But Georgette's gonna sing harmony with me. She's gonna sing it with me. So we will attempt. Your good girl's gonna go bad. I have to stand up, stand up with me. I've never seen the inside of a bar room. Or listen to a jukebox all night long But I see these are the things that bring you pleasure So I'm gonna make some changes in our home Well, I've heard it said, if you can't beat them, join them So if that's the way you wanted me to be I'll change if it takes that to make you happy from now on, you're gonna see a different me. Because your good girl's gonna go bad. I'm gonna be the swingingest swinger you've ever had. If you like them, paint it up, powder it up, then you ought to be glad. Because your good girl's gonna go I'll even learn to like the taste of whiskey In fact, you'll hardly recognize your wife I'll buy some brand new clothes and dress up fancy For my journey to the wilder side of life Because your good girl's gonna go bad I'm gonna be the swingingest swinger you've ever had Georgette, you sound a lot better than that guy she used to sing with. <laughs> oh, I'd like to share with uh, Georgette a story about her dad. About 1990, um, there was a phone call on our Codaphone, and it was George Jones. And he says, uh, Jet, if you could call me back as soon as pos possible, I'd appreciate it. Well, we had called in, and we were at a Petro truck stop. So I called... And George says, where are you? I said, well, I'm outside of Knoxville. He says, can you get to Pensacola? I said, well, sure, why? He goes, well, I'm doing a little show down here with Merle Haggard and Conway Twitty, and I, I want you to come down here and sing a couple of songs with us. I said, I'm taking a left-hand turn, and I'll be there before the sun comes up. <laughs> and so uh, it was a great honor because I got to meet Conway and Merle and George. And then George liked to open the show. You were talking about the slots. Yeah. He, he always says, I want to be number one. And he says, that way, you know, I can go on home and watch television. <laughs> so anyway, what he, what he did for me was in the middle of his show, he says, I've got a surprise for you folks. I want to bring out a little girl, and you're going to love her just as much as I do. And he gave me the honor of being on stage with three of the greatest country music singers and to share part of his... Uh, uh, show and to sing and so he wrapped his arms around me along with uh, Conway and Merle and you know Especially just starting out to have I mean I call them the uh, Sequoias of country music stand up there and reach their arms around you uh, It's a true love of country music and the heroes 
That's, that's a great story. We got the youngins here today, the offspring of a lot of country music legends. Robin Young, Farron Young was his dad. I guess everybody in this room worked with Farron. We knew him. We can all tell Farron Young stories. Are, are you, are you Farron's oldest? Uh, second oldest. Second oldest. You know, I've always heard that you can't swing a dead cat in this town without hitting somebody who can tell you a fair and young story. <laughs> <laughs> and I have found that to be true. I was out on the lake, out on Percy Priest Lake this year, out on the boat, and was sitting there talking to somebody, and was just, they were asking about my dad, and I was telling them that. I said, man, I hear stories about my dad all the time. Somebody leaned over and said, who is your dad? And I said, fair and young. They said, he ran through our fence one night. <laughs> and... Uh, and they, they sat there talking. They said, this, we, looked, we heard this awful bang, and we looked in this car. This Lincoln was up through our fence and went out there, and your dad got out of the car, and he's like, well, I'm sorry. I'll pay for that. Tried to get the car started, and I think there was a two-by-four or something shoved up under the axle, and he couldn't get it out. So he asked them to give him a ride home, and they said, you know, well, we were a little irate. I mean, this guy just tore down our fence, and now we got to take him home. So they started taking him home, and he made him stop at four bars on the way before he got there. <laughs> So they ended up spending the whole evening with him. I'll tell you what, it's thanks to your dad that I have a recording contract in this, had a recording contract here. I came to Nashville to do my original demos. Joe Allison produced them, and my dad was in town with me, and Joe said, I gotta do something about getting your dad out of here because all he wanted to do, about like your dad, went, no, 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 you need to do this part again, and do this part again. So my, Joe called your father to come and get my dad to go to all of those four bars <laughs> so that I could get a recording session done. That's true. <laughs> what was it like growing up as Farron Young's son? Well, you know, people used to ask me that all the time. What's it like having a celebrity for a father? And I was like, I don't know. I don't have anything to compare it to. You know, he's just dad. I mean, he's, uh, if anything, sometimes I was jealous of the other kids that I went to school with because their daddies worked nine to five and they were home every night and uh, out doing things with him to where my dad was this guy that used to show up once every month or two. And he would, you know, come in the house and, you know, maybe we'd go out and do something. Maybe we, we wouldn't. Maybe he'd head out to the golf course or whatever. So, I mean, you would see him at times. And, uh, but, I mean, we always got along real good. We had fun the few times that we did get together and do stuff. Uh, I know one time when I was a little bitty boy, he was trying to teach me to ride a bicycle without training wheels on it. And he, his method was real good. He put you on it. We had an eight and a half acre yard with a big circle driveway. He ran me about four acres of the way down and let go. And I crashed and burned and got up. About that time, there was a Cadillac pulling in the driveway. And this guy gets out of the car and goes, Farron, what are you trying to do, kill that boy? And he goes, no, I'm trying to teach him to ride this bicycle. So I'm over crying. The guy came over and dusted me off. And he said, I tell you what, Farron, go away for a minute. He sat there and talked to me for a minute. And he pulled out a big silver dollar out of his pocket and said, you see that? And I was like, yeah, I see that. And he goes, I'll tell you what, you get on this bicycle and you ride around this circle drive one time, I'm going to give you this silver dollar. I got on that bicycle. You would have thought I was evil Knievel. I had it on the back <laughs> wheel, everything going around there. He gave me the silver dollar. Well, at that time, I didn't know who this was, but I found out later. One time I asked Daddy, I said, who was that guy that taught me, that was wearing all the fringe and stuff, taught me to ride the bicycle? And he said, that was Lefty Frizzell. Of course, I spent the dollar. You know, I didn't know. Had I knew <laughs> then what I knew now, you know, I would have kept the... Uh, was there a lot of music around your house growing up? Did any of the other... Pretty um, good bit. I mean, Dad, of course, you know, Dad was friends with, with you and everybody with Webb. Uh, Webb would come over to the house, George. Uh, uh, you know, I think Hank Jr. lived over there by us for a little while, and then uh, Harlan Howard lived up on the hill behind us. Uh, we had people, you know, coming over all the time to the house, Brenda Lee, uh, God, everybody, you know, so, I mean, it was, you kind of grew up around these people, you know, and, I mean, I knew my dad was somebody, and he was a celebrity, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, he was just dad, you know. I'm sure everybody in here has got a fair and young story. Michael? Well, one of my favorites, my, my dad told me back in his rock and roll days when he was working in, I think he said some in the late 50s, and he was on a show with Farron, because sometimes back then, he was rockabilly, they would put, rock and country. of course, he was a big fair and young fan, dad was, he said he was all nervous and everything. And he'd never met your dad before, Robin. And uh, dad said he went out and he did his thing, you know, opened the show one. Said after, during intermission, said uh, Farron said, "Hey, hey, boy, come here a minute." Dad said, "Yes, sir." He said, you sang pretty good, boy. What takes your name anyway? And dad said, "Conway Twitty." And Farron said, "Hell, you can't help that." <laughs> <laughs> It's 
Smokey. Uh, I got a, a, a quick Farron Young story. It starts out with a, a close departed friend of mine, and I'm sure many people here, Rusty Goodman. Who, the Goodman family, yeah. Well, prior to being a member of the Goodman family, he was a member of the Plainsman Quartet. Roy Clark's familiar with the Plainsman Quartet. Toured with Jimmy Davis. They worked a show in, in Des Moines for KRNT. The Plainsmen were on the show. All, I can remember two groups that were on the sh show. The Plainsman and Farron Young and his band. I forgot who else was on the show. Maybe somebody in this room was on that show. But prior to joining the Happy Goodman family, uh, Rusty was a, a cigar-smoking friend of mine. There are a few of us left in this world, but, but Rusty loved to smoke cigars. Before the plainsmen were called on, he had a cigar fired up and was talking to somebody and realized that they had been introduced on stage, and he rushed out and laid his cigar on a little box by the corner of the stage. And they were out singing, and the cigar caught the stage curtain on fire. And while the, the Plainsman Quartet are singing their hearts out, on center stage, the smoke starts coming around the corner of the curtain. <laughs> I mean, fogging it out around there. And the, the show kept going on. And the first thing you know, here comes Farron Young, had got the fire, the big fire extinguisher back in the stage, from the stage hands, and he come out pumping that thing right around the corner. <laughs> And he, a bigger show was going on at the end of the, of the end of the curtain than there was out at the Plainsman Quartet. And I thought that was the funniest thing that I'd ever seen. <laughs> Would that make Far Were you on that show? Would that make Skeeter Farron Young the show. first country artist to do smoke? You know, have a smoky yeah, stage? No, no. Hey, there's, there's some stories about Roger Miller and Farron Young that I can't tell. I'd love to. But you, because they, 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 uh, the FCC wouldn't allow it. Uh, I guarantee that. No, but Farron sold me uh, my first bus. Uh, it's, well, not my first bus, but uh, really my first bus. Because I sold the one I had to Mel Atelis. And it was a, a, a little dog, but it was great. You know, a little. You know, I'm Roger Miller. Dog, I mean, a dog. Dale, but he did Roger sell me Miller. Bus had one of the best lines, because everybody used to always, nobody ever accused Dad of being soft-spoken. I mean, you knew exactly where you stood with that man. That's right. And uh, Roger Miller, I think Ralph Emery interviewed Roger one time, and Roger had the greatest quote about Dad. He said, Farron Young had a mouth as big as his heart. And I, I just, hey, that's you know. Was. <laughs> yeah. The story, I think people uh, may know the story, so correct me if I get any details wrong, but apparently, uh, when my dad was young and struggling, he was uh, out back of the Opry one night and real upset about not, you know, doing too well in the music business. And Farron came by and said, you know, what's the matter with you, boy? You know, and he said, uh, I'm, you know, I'm just trying so hard to make it in, in the music business. And uh, Farron said, well, I need a drummer. Do you play drums? And my dad said, I'll learn. And Farron sent him down and said, you know, go here and I'll set you up with a drum kit and you just build it to me. And, and if you can learn to play drums by Monday or whatever, uh, you can play drums with me. And my dad went and got that drum kit and learned to play drums and went on the road with Farron and played drums. And for years, uh, every time we'd see Farron, Farron would say, you owe me $800, boy, for that drum kit. <laughs> well, so he was always amazed with Roger. He said, Roger can do anything. There's nothing that Roger can do. I mean, from writing a Broadway uh, musical to learning to play drums, you know, in an hour before he goes, he could do anything. Yeah, with Roger, it's, it, in my dad's band, I, that's why I can't remember what Roger played. Because every Everything. time we went out, he played a different instrument. Mm -hmm. He played bass one time, he played fiddle another time. You, you throw him an accordion, he'll play that, you know. Well, we've had some great entertainers in this business through the years, Roger Miller being one of them. But Farron Young, to me, still is uh, pretty much the epitome of walking out on stage and capturing an audience. He, uh, he could walk out and he could do just about anything he wanted to do. And I don't know if, we, if this was a Smokey Smith tour or if it was an Abe Hamza tour or something. We were on a tour, and uh, Farron was on the tour. Uh, uh, um, da -da Who's uh, Yeah, I, one of my senior moments. <laughs> one of those senior moments. Uh, Ferlin Husky, and you know Ferlin and Ferlin had he he had this alter ego thing going all the time, and he did all of these inter, you know impressions of everybody. And uh, we had we had done about three or four days, 
And Farron had listened to everything that Ferlin had done. So Farron went on before Ferlin. It was one of those things, you know, where he, uh, Ferlin, was, Ferlin was the star. So Farron went on before him, and he started doing all these imitations. Did his whole show. Did his whole Pardon? Did his whole show. Did his whole show. And, and, uh, and uh, Ferlin was back in the dressing room, you know, and uh, so he knew it was about time for him to go on. So he got ready, and he walked out to the edge of the stage, and here's Farron doing all of his impressions. He, in fact, doing Ferlin's entire show. That's what he did. And uh, he, he was, you know, Ferlin, you know how Farron was. He was just, uh, he was having himself a ball, and the audience was loving it. And uh, all of a sudden, he looked over the side of the stage, and, and Ferlin had walked out to the edge of the stage. And <laughs> he continued on with what he was doing and finished the song. And about the time he finished, Ferlin had gotten mad enough that he started walking out on the stage. Ferlin walked on one side, Farron went out the other side, <laughs> and Ferlin walked up to the microphone. He had said, you have just seen my show. <laughs> Kept going and <laughs> <laughs> all the way to the hotel, Farron locked himself in. <laughs> but Farron was a great entertainer. But so Ferlin Husky, you know, we've had so many great ones through the Who years. But... One time I was on a plane in Dallas and Farron got on and he said, I'll just sit here by the big boy. And I, he yeah. sat down. And Farron had probably had some real strong Coca-Cola that day. <laughs> and he started talking to me, and he told me, he said, I hear you're getting a divorce, boy. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, we ain't going to let that happen. He said, what about that son of yours? I said, Farron, everything's okay. Don't worry about it. No, nah, we ain't going to let that happen. As soon as we get back to Nashville, we're going out to your house. And I'm going to talk to your wife, and y'all going to work this out, and you're going to stay together. I said, no, we ain't, Farron. Just leave it alone. <laughs> he said, yes, we are. Well, we got off the phone, some, uh, got off the plane, something else happened. He got me in some more trouble, almost got me whipped. But anyway, he didn't go home with me. But then when he and Hilda were getting a divorce, I called him, and I said, we're going out to your house and talk to Hilda. <laughs> And he said, that ain't funny, fat boy. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> now, let me oh, tell you about Farron. Now, I want to tell you. My mother taught Farron in high school in Shreveport, Louisiana. And uh, Farron was so rowdy that Mama, and, and Mama heard him singing going down the hallway. And she stopped and said, you know, you have a beautiful voice. I love your voice. Why don't you do something with it? And he said... I am. I'm singing every day. And he said, well, if you would put out that cigar, and he was smoking a cigar down the hallway of high school, put out that cigar, I want to talk to you. And mother was a substitute teacher. She said, look, these kids are driving me crazy, and uh, I know you've got some uh, promise. Have you ever been to Louisiana Hayride? He said, no. He said, how would you like to go backstage to the Hayride? Yeah, how can you get me backstage? Said, well, my son... Uh, knows everybody. He carries Hank Williams' guitar, and he knows everybody, and he will take you backstage. You've got to calm the class down. And so when that bell rang for the class, Farron <laughs> jumped up, and he said, I'm going to kill anybody that talks while Mrs. Kilgore's talking. I mean it. I'm going to take you out and kill you. And he controlled the class. And so I'm the guy that walked Farron backstage on the Santa Hayride. <laughs> Years later, I'm up in Nashville, and I'm gone through a divorce, and Farron calls me and says, uh, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm definitely going through the divorce, and uh, he didn't try to talk me out of it. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I think I'll buy me a condo. He said, no, 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 save your money. I bought this mansion out on Harbor Island. Bill Anderson lives out there, and uh, I'm going I'm to rent you the bottom half of the house and I'm gone all the time, and uh, Hank Jr. had just fell off the mountain, and I didn't have a job, so George Jones said, I want you to be the singing host of the Possum Holler. And <laughs> he said, singing maitre d'. I said, maitre d'? He said, okay, uh, what's another word? I said, host. He said, yeah, I like it better. So Farron said, you come and, and you live with me. We'll live together, just the two of us. We'll have fun. I said, great. And uh, I, back, I hadn't had a drink in 21 years so back then. But in those days, I would have a drink or two. And uh, Farron was a great, yeah, he was a great cook, though. I mean, he could cook my favorite. 
shake and bake pork chops, Crowder peas with Crowder peas with onions, uh, sweet kidding. potatoes. He, he knew how to cook, man, just like we were the original odd couple. He called me at the Hall of Fame uh, bar, Motor Inn bar, and he said, hey, brother, are you coming home early? <laughs> yes, Sheriff, I'll be home probably as soon as the traffic dies down, about 6.30. He said, don't lie to me now. I got your favorite, shake and bake pork chops. <laughs> I got some candied yams that are delicious. I got Crowder peas and I got the onions I'm chopping up in, the little tiny onions, you'll like that. And I got you some fresh sliced tomatoes. I said, great. Now, what time will you be home? I said, 6.30 to 6.45. He said, okay. And about midnight, <laughs> I got it, the waitress said, Merle, you got a phone call. <laughs> and this boy said, listen, you think I slave over this hot stove? <laughs> cooking you shake and bake, sweet potatoes, crowder peas. He said, don't even think about coming home on an empty stomach. You better stop at the Waffle House because Byron Binkley's dog Fluffo is getting your meal. Good night. But you know what? He was a wonderful neighbor out there. Whenever anything would go wrong in the neighborhood, if we had snow, Farron was out shoveling everybody's driveway. I mean, he was, he was a wonderful, wonderful neighbor. Uh, Bill, I... And I got... Hold it. I got to tell you one more, Bill, because <laughs> okay. you, you probably had this. This is a quickie. I'm downstairs, just got out of the pool. We had an indoor swimming pool. Oh, it was a beautiful place. And uh, I'm laying down, uh, just got out of the pool, and uh, he came down to Merle couple of gnat blowers up there to see you. I said, gnat blowers? I said, oh, okay. Thought it was a figure of speech. I went upstairs, and there was two guys, and they had little gnats, just like in a cartoon, little gnats all over their faces. And they said, hey, Merle, pff, pff, uh, pff, you and Farron need a little yard work? <laughs> No, we do our own. Thank you. Okay, follow that. Did they ever that. come out your house? I can't, no. I, I can't follow that. I can't. Billy, what but, you got? You know, really, the. The side of the business that. <laughs> Are you crazy? Robin, you're doing some singing. We've worked some things together. You, I don't think you look a lot like your dad. You're a good bit bigger than he is, but boy, when you want to, boy, you short him. Well, him off, too, I yeah. can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, open a can of worms. When I was 13 years old, I was bigger than dad. And I came in with a bad report card one day, and he had raised us to where we said, yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am. You didn't ever say what or huh. It was always, I beg your pardon. And I had this bad report card, and he was getting on me. And I, every time he talked, I'd stand up out of the chair, and he'd go, sit down, boy. And he'd set me back down. I'm telling you, your grades better come up. I'd stand up, sit down, boy. And he kept pushing me down, and I couldn't understand. Finally, I got back up, and he said, will you quit standing up? I ain't going to look up at you to chew your butt out. <laughs> the point I was making about this is while you don't necessarily look like your dad, you sure can sing like him and yeah, sound like yeah. him when you yeah, want to. Do us some fair and young music. Now. Okay. We're going to do you one that uh, a nice, clean-cut fella came to town. Like you were talking about how Dad used to help people out. This clean-cut fella came into town and met Dad up at Tootsie's Orchid Lounge one day and pitched him this song. This guy's name was Willie Nelson, by the way. And uh, Dad cut this song, and there's kind of an old story I'll tell real quick about where 
uh, back in those days, I think the singers got their money quicker than the songwriters did. And Willie was kind of hurting for some money, so he came back up after Dad had cut the song and said, Farron, let me just sell you that song. I need some money. And Dad said, no, don't you sell that song to nobody. He said, you know, I'm gonna, that song's fixing to be a hit, Willie. I just made some good money. You're going to make money. And Willie was like, no, let me just sell it to you. And Dad said, no, what do you need to get by? Willie said, well, $500. So Dad gave him $500 and said, don't sell the song to anybody. Willie got his first royalty check in. I think it was for like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Dad said next thing he knew, he was in Tootsie's one day, and all of a sudden a hand come around him, grabbed him by the face, opened his mouth up, and Willie Nelson French kissed Farron Young right there at Tootsie's <laughs> Oregon Lounge. Dad said it was the best he was ever kissed by a man his entire life. And this is the song. Hello, Walls. Well, I think it's going for you today. Now, don't you miss her? Since our darling walked away, and I'll bet you dread to spend another lonely night with me. With only walls, I'll keep you in company. Hello, window. Hello, hello. Well, I see that you're still here. Now, don't you miss her? Hello. Since our darling disappeared, and looky there is that a teardrop in the corner of the pane. Now, don't you try to tell. Left us all alone the way she planned. I guess we'll have to get along without her if we can. Hello, ceiling. Hello, hello. I'm gonna stare at you while you know I can't sleep. Hello. So won't you bear with me a while? We must all stick together or else I'll lose my mind. I've got a feeling she'll be gone a long, long time. Yeah, I've got a feeling she'll be gone a long, long time. Rex Allen Jr. Now we, we've been talking about Ronnie Ronnie Robbins doesn't want to be Marty Jr. or, or Robin Young, Farron Jr. or Michael Twin, but you are Rex Allen Jr. Has that been a help? Yeah, or? I even have the middle name, which is that. Did, my dad's real name is not Rex Allen. His first name is actually begins with an E. It's Elvy. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Isn't that horrible? It's shocking. L L V Rex Allen. He changed it to Rex Allen. <laughs> That's her Elvis. Yeah. No, I always tell everybody my middle name. It you change the E to an S, and I'd be dead and rich. You know. <laughs> No, the same conversation that which which one of the juniors had about changing their name, because I was yeah you I you went by Marty Robbins Jr. Well, I did we did the same thing when I came out of the service. My dad set me down and said, "Now if you're ever going to change your name, now's the time." And I about that time was when uh, Buck son Buddy Allen was out and had a lot of records and they and I'd listen to the radio and they'd say, "This is Buddy Allen." Buck Owens' son, and then they'd say, that's Buck Owens' son, buddy, and so on and so forth, and I thought it wouldn't make any difference. And all of, all of us juniors know the same thing. It doesn't make any difference. They still know you. They still will say that you're Rex Allen Jr., or they'll still even mispronounce you and say that you're Ronnie Robbins. No, uh, Marty Robbins Jr. No. Your dad had a little bit different background in that not only was he a singing star, he was, he was a movie star in, in the cowboy movies and all. How, how did that make, make your life uh, any different. It, it, the, the good things are 
the wonderful memories I have are, are things like uh, going on a camping trip. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm not like Willie, you know. <laughs> but going on a camping trip with Slim Pickens, driving along, and Dad and Slim were in the front seat, and me and my brother and Daryl Ann, who was Slim's daughter, in the back seat, and we're driving along, going to some place to camp, and Slim and Dad getting snake bit in the front of the car. Uh-huh. Snake. Uh-huh. Yeah, they get snake bit, and they have to get a snake medicine. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But uh, wonderful memories like that. The other ones are, that are really, really neat, and all of us will tell you the same thing. There's some just, I can remember one of the most unbelievable memories was I was flying with my dad because like every other junior, like what you said, your dad would kiss you goodbye in about June and said, I'll see you sometime in September. Mm-hmm. And I'd go on the road with dad, and he would, uh, we were on a plane once coming out of Denver going to, Boise, Idaho, or something like that. And the plane stopped in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. And the pilot came back before they landed and said, this, Mr. Allen, there are 4,000 people at the airport in Rapid City. He says, I know you're not getting off there, but they heard you were on the flight. And would you mind stepping off the plane and just waving? So dad says, sure. So we stopped, and one, one poor fella got off the plane there. There are only about four of us left, you know. But there were 4,000 people there, and the pilot came over to Dad and said, if you'd like to sign autographs or something like that, don't worry about it. We'll just wait until you get finished. And so we waited until we got finished and then took off, and the pilot came to me, and he says, you want to go up and sit in the co-pilot seat? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. He says, have you ever seen Mount Rushmore? I said, no, sir. He said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, those kind of memories are the kind you, you, never, you, you can't lose. But, and but it, you know, Rex, how is your dad? I, I know your dad is great. not deceased. He's, no, no, no. He's dad's still with very, us. very much alive. He's doing wonderful. He lives in Tucson, Arizona. He's, uh, he has, the health problems that dad has are he has bad, very poor circulation. He's had... And he's had uh, that surgery where they cut you from here all the way up through the groin and replace the arteries. And then they did that on, twice on this side, and it didn't work. And then he refused to have it on this side. And then he's had that artery surgery over here. And he's had brain surgery. What he's doing? Three, three four times. Well, he just got married about three years ago, so he's something's working great. right. You know? <laughs> he's doing great. And, and my wife hopes that stays in the genes, you know. <laughs> What's the song, The Last of the Silver Screen Cowboys? Last of the Silver Screen Cowboys is a song that was written by Steve Dorff and uh, some fellow named Snuff Garrett. Snuff, Snuff yeah. <clears throat> I didn't, no, I don't need that one. Uh, and uh, this was a song that, I did a, a whole album of Western songs called the Singing Cowboy Album. And th- talk about memories again. Uh, in all the years that I've worked on the road and stuff like that, my dad and I have only performed together like three times. We never, never went on the road together or anything like that. I mean, I went out and I'd perform a dad's show or something like that, but after I started having hits or stuff, dad and I never worked together, which is really a shame, and I missed it once, once or twice or three times. Well, is this song about him? This song uh, is about Silver Screen Cowboys. It's about all of them, Roy and Gene and all of those, those kind of people, and the original record has the narration of dad and, and Roy Rogers in it. We got Roy to come in and do the narration. And the cutest story about this song is the Silver Screen Cowboys, it was cut with a big orchestra and, and so caps, you need to tune up the 12 string on this one. <laughs> yeah. And, but the cutest story is, is that Dad went in and did his narration. Of course, Dad, you know, and Charlie, that lonesome cougar, he went and got all them flapjacks. You know, he does all those narrations. And Roy went in and did his narration. They came back in the studio, and we were listening to the playback, and Roy started shaking his head and laughing, and Dad said, what's the problem, Roy? He says, the older I get, the more I sound like Gabby Hayes. (laughs) (laughs) They aren't here, so I'll have to sing them, I guess. But that's where the song came from. Pretty song. About the good old days, really. You know, all of you paid a dime for a movie, and I don't think those days will ever come back fully. See if this brings back a memory anyway. The last of the silver screen cowboys. The last of a fast dying breed. Cattle grazing, 
six guns blazing God knows this is what America still needs the last of the silver screen cowboys standing tall for what he believes is right and now don't you push him around Cause more than one villain's found That he don't back down from a fight Roy and Trigger, we love you And Hoppy, we saved up our dimes For the Saturday sat through both movies two times. Gene, Lash, and Rex were our heroes. We knew good would win in the end. If we could just turn back the page Ride those old trails once again. Now do that, the last of the silver screen cowboys. We settle the score with our fists. Oh, we loved the little babies, treated women like ladies but it was only our horse that we ever kissed then Roy then the time slipped away before we knew it and you little wranglers gave up your play guns and your toys oh but memories don't die no, they're still riding high Cause they're the last of the silver screen That is so good. I never, ever think of Rex Allen, but I don't think of the streets of Laredo. Streets of Laredo. You want to hear that? Yes, I do. Oh, here, you got to hold We're going to trade microphones. Did you, while you're doing that, let me, let me just ask you now, were people like Roy Rogers and, and Gene Autry and Hopalong Cassidy, did they hang around your house when you were growing well, up? I mean, well, were they your yeah, playmates? All of those. Uh, I, uh, Dusty Rogers, I used, he used to come spend... Two weeks at my house in the summer, and I'd go spend two weeks at his house in the summer when we were little boys growing up. And uh, a lot of the cowboy singers, you know, all of the old pioneers were there. Bob Nolan used to come over to the house for dinner all the time and sing songs and people like that. It was a lot of fun, you know. But like you, you don't really notice it. Any of us juniors, you, they're just people that are friends, aren't they? You know, but here's the... There has to be a theme song for Dad. It'd probably be this one. Oh, good luck. <laughs> uh, as I walked out in the streets of Laredo, as I walked out in Laredo one day, I spied a young cowboy all dressed in white linens, all dressed in white linen, as cold as a clay. Beat the drum slowly, play the fife slowly, play the death march as you carry me along, and take me to the green valleys, there lay the sod o'er me, for I 
young cowboy I know I've done wrong Let sixteen gamblers come carry my coffin Let sixteen cowboys come sing me a song And take me to the green valley There lay the sod o'er me For I'm a young cowboy I know I've done wrong Beat the drum slowly Play the fife lowly And play the death march As you carry me along And take me to the green valley there lay the sod o'er me For I'm a young cowboy I know I've done Jed, I guess all you know of, of your dad, Hank Williams, is the things that, uh, that you've been told and the things that you've learned through uh, a very painful process of having to go through the courts to uh, establish your own identity, really. Well, you know, Bill, uh, not only have my dad's friends shared stories with me, but also to his fans, and they've made him come alive to me as a person. You know, and uh, I mean, I grew up opposite of most of the stories I've heard, you know, about how this was dad and he's famous. Well, I grew up saying Hank Williams was famous and I became an adult and I said, wait a minute, that's my dad. You know, so I had the, uh, maybe the, the tails to the heads of the coin. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an honor to, uh, to be here this uh, evening but also to, to sit and share the stories, you know, and to, uh, uh, and I've been very fortunate to perform with most of the folks here, and uh, I tell you, there's, there's, there's nothing like country music. Well, you're certainly a marvelous part of it these days. I couldn't help but wonder, having Merle Kilgore in the room and knowing Merle's background in, in Shreveport, did you know about this young lady? Did you know that Hank Williams had a daughter all those years? Did you know no, her not daughter? No, not until the lawsuit. Actually, Bill, I, I laugh and say I can't lie about my age. You know, women really don't like to talk about their weight or their age. <laughs> but if I lie about my age, you could lose a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> you told the story of your life and, and your struggle to uh, establish your, your identity and all in, in a book. I can't think of the name of the book right off. The name of the book is called Ain't Nothing as Sweet as My Baby. Yeah. And my dad uh, wrote that song and it talks about a, a blue, blue-eyed, blonde-haired little baby girl. How did you feel when, when you began to suspect that you were Hank Williams' daughter? Well, you know, I mean, that's like... It's unbelievable. I mean, there's, there's really no words to... Uh, I mean, that's like saying, I'm going to give you a uh, billion dollars. But it's more than the money. No, I'm, I'm using that as just a, uh, an example. I mean, as, as, as exaggerated as that is, is the fact that they say, you know, Hank Williams might be your daddy. You know, and I mean, I, what I'm saying is you cannot comprehend that, that thought process. And I, and I put it into to money. It's like saying, I'm going to give you a trip to the moon. You know, it, just, it doesn't register. But for me, the thing that, that was the most important thing of everything was being adopted twice. Everybody wants to be wanted. And uh, through the process that I had to go through, documents were turned over to where not only did I find out that a man by the name of Hank Weems was my daddy, my daddy wanted me. And I think that that says a lot for the man, Hank Williams, that he stood up for his unborn child. There was a letter, right? That Actually, what, what they refer to it is called a pre-birth custody contract. Uh, 
which was uh, drawn up by his attorney. It was notarized, and it was signed by him. Saying that at a certain age, he would have full custody of you, right? That's correct. And like I said, you know, you have to look at uh, back then at that time, but uh, that Hank Weems wanted his child, made provisions for that child, sight unseen. It didn't, it, it had a lot of detail to it, you know, about who was going to do what, as in I could have visitation with my mother. But the thing about it is, is it, it didn't care whether, it didn't say whether this is a boy or girl, whether it was healthy or not. It's just that I'm taking this baby. And as I said, that, that says, uh, to me, you know, you listen to his songs, but also to me, I think he gave me a little bit of his heart. You never knew your mother either, did you? I never met her. By the time I found out who she was, she had passed away. And in fact, I had hoped that uh, I could find somebody that could say, yeah, your daddy told me that, that he was your daddy. But I got better than that. I got my father's signature on a legal piece of paper saying yes. And uh, there is no amount of money in the world that anyone could give me because that means more to me than anything in the whole world is to be wanted, especially by my dad. Billy Walker, you worked one of the last shows or were with Hank Williams at one of the last shows he played, weren't you? Yeah, I was his opening act for 10 days from uh, December the 11th. We opened in uh, uh, Houston, Texas, and we worked all of South Texas and Dallas and Waco and uh, Bryan or Snook, Texas. And then the last date was in Austin on December the 21st of 1952, and that was 10 days before he died. And uh, I've tried to retrace what happened to him when I left him. And uh, he came back down to, uh, to Greenville, around Greenville uh, and Montgomery, and he went and spent uh, Christmas Eve with the old boy that he started out with down in Pensacola, Florida. That was down... Pappy McCormick, because I talked to Pappy McCormick about his actions and uh, tried to retra retrace as many steps as I could to find out exactly what happened to him. And, of course, everything is really pretty sketchy uh, along that. Hank Williams knew that he was in trouble uh, with uh, the pain medication that he was taking. He got hooked on, on uh, pain medication that was for his back. And uh, he told me that uh, because he rode with me all the time we were on this trip, we were, we were together constantly for over two weeks, night and day. And he told me personally, he said, I'm going to the Caribbean uh, right after New Year's Day. And he said, uh, I'm going to try to get myself straightened out because I'm going back to the Opry February and you're going with me. That's what he told me. He said, you're going with me. You're not going to be part of my act, but I'm going to help you, and you're going to open my shows uh, until you get started, uh, things working out on your own. And he said, I'm going to go get myself straightened out because I know uh, what my life is, is, is doing. Did he ever mention to you that Bobby Jett was pregnant with his child? Did he ever no, bring that up at all? Uh, no, he, he, never, he never did. Uh-uh. We did have a $5 bet on your cheating heart and collide you, though. Betting what? Well, see, it, it wasn't out then. He had recorded it, and he had some, uh, some demos on it. And so he played me collide you, and he says, that'll be the biggest song ever recorded. And so he paid me your cheating heart, and I said, you're a crazy guy. He said, I said, your cheating heart's a lot. But he said, I'll bet you it's going to be the biggest. Of course, I never got to collect my $5. <laughs> Charlie Walker, you must, you must have known Hank Williams fairly well. Uh, hand Charlie a microphone over there, one right there on the table. I'm sure you probably, as a disc jockey, you probably interviewed him. Yeah, I had, Bill, I had a nightclub in San Antonio. I did five hours a day for 15 years there, and I had a nightclub, 51, 52, 53, and 54. I sold it in 54. Uh, Hank worked for me on his last birthday, September 17, 1952. Mm. And uh, I went and had a birthday cake made for him about, Three foot square, I guess. It cost me, I think, thirty-five dollars in. That's a lot of money in nineteen fifty-two. Or uh, anyway, and so I hid it behind the piano, and that night, and he was so hot. I mean, it, 
because uh, I, I would go and I'd buy my own newspaper advertising and everything. I had them draw up the, the drawing with the ropes around it and everything. And he was so hot, and when we had the biggest crowd we'd ever had, and we'd had, you know, Carl Smith and Webb Pierce and, and everybody. And, um, but I, when he sang, uh, he sang Jambalaya. It was the biggest thing going. Every jukebox in the country had it on. And when he finished that song, I took the cake and pulled it around in front of me. We had about 850 people out in this patio, and I got them, and they sung uh, Happy Birthday to You. And he cried, had big tears coming down his cheeks, and he said, I ain't never been treated this good before. And I'd just give anything. We were broadcasting it, too. Uh, you know, I wish I could go back and have a copy of all those. We broadcast every Friday night and Saturday night from my club, and I, I just never thought to tape them. The guy on the station, I was buying time from him, and he, I was paying him more money to buy radio time than he was paying me to work at the station, you know, but I was making all right. No, he did, and he, and he came and did my show. I called his room uh, that morning, and the boy that was traveling with him, uh, what was his agent's name from down in Montgomery, uh, was with him at the time. Can't think of it right now, but I don't sound right. But anyway, I've still got the contract that they signed, you know, to do the show. And I uh, called him and I said, uh, is there any possibility of Hank coming over and doing my radio show? Just a block and a half from where I was. He said, Charlie, he hadn't done a radio show in a year. He said, he just doesn't feel up to it. He said, uh, uh, he won't do it. And I said, well, is he there? He said, yeah, he's right here. So he gets on the phone and I said, Hank, this is Charlie Walker. He said, yeah, how you doing, pal? I said, I'm fine. I said, is there any chance you doing my radio show this afternoon? I said, if you can just come over for 15 minutes, let everybody know you're in town and so forth. And I said, I'll send a car, we'll pick you up, bring you up to the stage. And he said, no, you don't need to do that. I said, I'll be there. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'll be there. So he came up and he stayed, I guess, 45 minutes. He had a, a fishing cap on with a long, one of those long bills that had the visor, uh, you know, sun visor down in front of it. And he had on a pair of shoes, a pair of jeans. And he told me his feet had been bothering him and he didn't wear his cowboy boots. And he didn't wear them that night on the show either at the club. But he had his white fringe suit on with the, the fringe and uh, you that you've seen in pictures and everything. Did one of the greatest shows that I ever saw. I think he, he didn't do any drinking at all that night. And uh, I know Jim Denny called me Monday morning. This was on a Friday and said, well, I understand Hank was there. I said, yeah, and of course, you know, he had left the opera. And he said, how do you do? And I told him, I said, man, it's one of the greatest shows we ever had. I said, everything was wonderful. And there was dead silence. And Jim said, well, he said, that's wonderful to hear. I'm glad to know that. But we had a great time. And uh, of course, the big fight broke out during the dance. And I won't tell the whole thing. but. And uh, some guy was trying to get into the dressing room to see Hank, and I told him, I said, you can't get in there. And I said, he's, he's, he's getting ready to leave, and this guy was pretty loaded. And, and he took a swing at me, and when he did, his, his hand hit Billy, was with him, and she was holding his cake, and the cake went everywhere. It was all over. <laughs> and then it made Hank mad, and Hank grabbed this big guy and pushed him right into me. And he was a, what we call him tush hog. I had two guards there at the club who took that many, and we could have used ten, but... And when Hank pushed this guy into me, why, of course, I grabbed about four or five other guys, and we got him and took him, threw him out of the club. And, and of course, he was already drunk and weighed about 260 pounds. When he hit that ground, he passed out. And as Hank left the club with those big, long legs, he stepped over this guy to get, get out of the club. <laughs> he said, I'll see you, pal. That's the last, thing I, last time I ever saw him. But it was a great experience. And the guy on the radio station, I'll say this, he uh, met me as I came out of the station that day, and he said, I thought you was going to have Hank Williams on with you this afternoon. I said, yeah, he was here. Well, he, said, he was looking for a guy come down, come down to the station with a fancy suit on and everything. I said, and you see that tall, skinny guy with that big, long, bill fishing cap come walking down the hall? He said, yeah, I wasn't Hank Williams. I said, yeah, he was. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I had some great memories. Yeah. Jet, sing us a Hank Williams song. It would be my pleasure. You got to stand up to sing Hank now. <laughs> now I know y'all don't know the, the words to any of the Hank songs, but if you can remember one or two, I'd like for y'all to sing along. Today I passed you on the street and my heart fell at your feet I can't help it if I'm still in love with you Somebody else 
stood by your side And she looked so satisfied I can't help it if I'm still in love with you A picture The only thing better than a Hank Williams song is two Hank Williams songs. <laughs> Can we get you to do one more? Oh, you betcha, but I got a little story to tell about this one. You know, there's been an awful lot of stories told on my dad. And, you know, to hear it from the, what I consider the horse's mouth, and that's someone that was there with my dad. I had the honor and the privilege of doing a show with Mr. Jimmy Dickens. And it was the first uh, time he ever met me, and Jerry Rivers, who played fiddle for my dad, says, well, well, Tater, what do you think about her? And he held his arms out and he goes, goosebumps. <laughs> and he's told me, he says, you know, Jet, let me tell you a little story about your dad. He says, we were on an airplane. And he says, you know, Tater, you need a song and I'm going to write it for you. And so little Jimmy told me, he says, now when Hank Williams is going to write a song, and he's going to give it to you. You sit up and pay attention. So he says, I got my pencil and paper. And your dad says, mm, so write down, um, uh, hey, good looking. What you got cooking? He said, your dad wrote that song just like that. And he says, Tater, that song's a good one, and it's going to number one. So little Jimmy says, I went off, and I sang, I practiced. He says, I ran into your dad about two weeks later. And he, he says, your dad says, Tater, you know that song I gave you? Tater says, yeah, Hank, I've been practicing it. And he says, forget it. It was too darn good. I recorded it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the true story of the Hey, Good Looking. Say hey, good looking. What you got cooking? How's about cooking something up with me? Saying hey, sweet baby. Don't you think maybe we could find us a brand new recipe? I got a hot rod for a two dollar bill. I know a spot right over the hill There's soda pop and medicine's free If you want to have fun, come along with me Saying, hey, hey, good looking What you got cooking? How's about cooking something up with me? Oh, 
I know from having talked to you earlier this year that the biggest thing that happened in your life over the past 12 months was making amends and friends with Hank Williams Jr. because there had been some animosity there for a while. Well, you know, Bill, you're absolutely right. And I'm real proud to stand here tonight and say that Hank Jr. and I have made peace. And we did it on our dad's 75th birthday and we both decided what better time for us to put our arms around each other and you know as I said not only do I think that our dad had a smile on his face I'd like to think that maybe he had a tear in his eye and also too maybe for the first time in the life or the death of Hank Williams he may be at peace because his children are no longer fighting that's wonderful that's, oh, it's so good to hear Merle Kilgore, you are Hank Williams Jr.'s uh, manager. Yes, I am. So you know that story from the other side. I oh, guess. absolutely, from the get-go. And uh, it's really amazing. Uh, a lot of people that uh, were siding up uh, on Jet's side with her husband, who's an attorney and a powerful attorney, too. You know, I mean, A tough. good attorney. I mean, a razor <laughs> attorney. A Keith great At attorney. Yeah, Keith Atkinson, you know. And... Uh, now they're so shocked uh, when they call. I said, well, it's okay with Keith. It's okay with me. And the guy will say, oh, 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 what? Are you kidding me? I said, no. And Keith does the same thing. It's okay with Merle. It's okay with me. And it's just a shocker, you know? Well, that's so wonderful. We're, it's that's so wonderful from, yeah. from all the angles. You grew up in the shadow of the Louisiana Hayride. So as a little boy, a young boy, you knew Hank Williams. Hank Absolutely. Senior. Yeah, you bet. And I worried him to death about, you know, how he write songs and he was always nice enough to tell me, you know. And I tell this story over and over because you got to get ideas from somewhere. I didn't realize it because I got on him one time. I said, Hank, how come you reading true romance comic books? My sister reads true romance comic books. Why do you read them sissy books? He said, sissy, hell, boy. Where do you think I get my ideas from? You know? <laughs> and he would read me a line out of, out of there, you know? He said, now, that would be a good idea for a song. And he'd turn a page and say, listen to this. That'll be a... He said, that's where you get ideas. And he said, listen to people's conversations. And he had a little bitty pencil. I never will forget. Little bitty pencil and a little small notebook. And somebody would crack something funny in the car, as musicians will do, you know, going down the road with nothing else to do, but think of funny, witty things. He'd write them down. And I said to myself, there goes another one. <laughs> of course, Merle Kilgore uh, grew up to be a pretty fair songwriter himself. How about doing one of your great songs? You wrote one of the, one of the great Johnny Cash classics. Where'd you get the idea for that? Did you get this out of True Romance? No, actually, uh, June and I were working the road show, uh, Johnny, for Johnny uh, Cash in 1962. And I lived about three blocks from her. She said, Kilgore, when we're off the road, let's just me and you write some songs, you know? I said, well, that sounds good. And we wrote a song called Promise to John that Hank Snow and Anita Carter recorded. And we got several songs recorded. And we'd write every day. So, uh, same thing. Got an idea for a song today, June? Well, I don't know, Kilgore. My back's been bothering me. And, uh, but, you know, she said, uh, I found an old letter that a friend of mine has gone through a divorce, and he's a picker from Chattanooga. And he said, uh, I'm through with love, but love is, is a burning thing. She said, I always thought that might be a good idea for a song. I said, yeah. And we started out on it, you know, and we got about a verse of it and, and part of the chorus. And Carlene had come home, and uh, she was making us some sandwiches. I think she was about 12 then. And uh, we got stuck. You know how you're know, writing songs, you just got stuck. And we were writing for her sister, Anita, and she had already had three of our songs. And uh, so I said, well, we'll finish it tomorrow. She said, yeah. I said, my back's killing me, and... Uh, We'll be ready tomorrow, and we already got three for Anita anyway. Well, I got home, and about an hour and a half later, she called. Kilgore, get over here quick. He said, they called back, and they need one more song for June. Let's finish that uh, Ring of Fire thing. So we went over there and knocked that out, and we sung it to him on the phone. Then we rushed down there and gave it to her, and she recorded that song that night. 
and she sings so beautiful, Anita Carter, and it was just like an angel singing. And it was a this was during the era of folk music, you know, and uh, '63, and it was just a beautiful folk song. And we were on tour with Johnny, and he said, "You know, I just love that Ring of Fire. I love that song." And he he came down at breakfast, and he said, "I don't know how to tell you all this, but I had a dream. I heard the Ring of Fire with Mexican trumpets, and I was singing it." And I thought he had maybe taken an old yeller or two too many. <laughs> but, but that was all right with me because I'd love to have a Johnny Cash record. You know, I said, great idea, Chief, great idea. <laughs> well, do the Merle Kilgore version of it for us. Sure. <laughs> love is a burning thing that it makes a fiery ring bound by wild desire i fell in your ring of fire i fell into a burning ring of fire i went down 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 and the flames went higher and it burns 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire. And Johnny Cash said, Sue it! <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear them boys play. <coughs> the taste of love is sweet, what hearts like ours meet. I fell for you like a child Oh, but the fire was wild I fell into a burning ring of fire I went down, down, down And the flames went higher And it burns, burns, burns The ring of fire The ring of fire And it burns, burns, burns the ring of fire, the ring of fire. Sue it! Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Merle. You know, one of the youngins we have uh, really not heard much from today, sitting right back there uh, between Robin Young and Charlie Leuven, yeah, Harold right Hawkshaw Hawkins. You are known as Hawkshaw Hawkins. Yeah. Junior. junior, I am. Okay, Harold so you've got the, uh, you've got got the, the junior name. name. Legitimate junior. This is a junior moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard nothing but wonderful things about you from somebody who's a big fan of yours who was here with us on some of our other family reunion shows, a lady named Jean Shepard. I guess you know who she is. Um, yeah, I think I've met her. Yeah. <laughs> Jean Shepard, your mama, was expecting you when your father was killed in the plane crash in 1963 with the Cowboy Copas, Randy Hughes, Patsy Cline. Mm -hmm. So you never actually knew No, he, he was killed March 5th. I was born April the 8th, 30, 33 days later. Bill, I was there when he was born also. I was there when a lot of them were born. Were you there when yes. I was born, Jay? No. <laughs> no, was, darling. Was, was I there, there when, when I was, I was born, born. Jane? <laughs> So, so the things that you know about, about your dad are things that people have told strictly, you down through the years. Of course, he was, as Harlan, we were talking earlier, he was a big, big man. Yes, he was six foot five from what I hear. Um, Harlan, I wrote for Harlan Howard for a year, and Harlan told me some stories. Of course, uh, the FCC probably wouldn't let me tell some of them stories. But, uh, hey, uh, do you know where uh, Hawk got his you, name Hawk you, Shaw. You said something to me earlier about that, and I'm, I'm not sure. I think I might know, but let's hear it. Well, Hawk Shaw, uh, Harold and a couple of other kids were playing in a alley back at his hometown, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a guy that came and swiped a bicycle from uh, one of his neighbors, and this neighbor come up and he said, uh, boy, do you see anybody fooling around my garage? Uh, uh, Earlier, and he said, yes, sir, I did. He said, that fella down the street came and got your bicycle. He said, you're a regular hawk show, aren't you? 
And that's where Hawkshaw got his name because Hawkshaw means super sleuth. I didn't know if you knew that or not. No, no, no. That's not the story I heard. I heard something about uh, six rabbits. Uh, Hawk was. Well, you tell yours. You tell yours. I thought sang y'all a song. How about that? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. You know, it's kind of foggy. My, my grandparents have been dead a long time, and um. We'll vote on them on your story. <laughs> well, the, yeah. Well, hey, it don't hurt to hear two of them. This um, this guy, he was shooting marbles, and this and Hawk had killed six rabbits, and Hawk um traded these six rabbits for his guitar, and Hawk learned to play the guitar, and this guy that um he traded the rabbits for is one that I heard named him Hawkshaw. Yeah, that's my story. That's, that's what good. I've heard. And I'm sticking, and sticking to it. To it. <laughs> and that's yeah. well, he yeah. had one of the most colorful nicknames, though. They used to call him the Hawk of the West Virginia Hills. Yeah, yeah. That always just sounded. I get goosebumps. Yeah. Hearing a name like. Well, on all his albums, it says "11 Yards of Personality." Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. I'd like I'd like to have met the guy. I got to watch him bowl one time. I bowled with him. Did you? That was the most remarkable thing I have ever seen. It was just like this huge, tall giant threw that ball. Why, those pins went, they just scattered like you've never seen before. I mean, it was just something I remember. It was just so wild. Harlan he was and so I, great. Harlan and I and Gene and Hawk would go bowling. Well, Hank, Hawk was so tall and his arms were so long. He would throw the ball and it wouldn't even hit the alley till it hit the pins. Halfway down. And I told Hawk, I said, it's bowling, not basketball. But the pins didn't have a chance because I mean, they're boing, I mean, all the way down there. But he's great. Did anybody ever ride in the car with him? I did. Yes. Worked with him. He Appleton. was known to put the pedal to the metal. Yeah, he flew. Oh, that's where I get it there. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's why I love you so much, too. He'd straighten out them curves up in West yeah, Virginia. Yeah, well, Mom can't drive, and uh, he... He put the pedal to the metal, so I got the combination of the both of them. I can't drive and I speed all the time. Give, give, give Charlie your microphone there, Skeeter. I got one Hawkshaw story. Uh, a bunch of us uh, was riding in Wilma Lee and Stoney's bus. We was on a tour. Well, they wanted Hawk to do some driving. And the first time he tried to stop it was the kind of brakes, you know, if you was on level ground, he'd check your speed like from 40 down to 25. But then the brakes would be hot, and uh, you didn't get much more slowing. And Hawkshaw told Stoney, Stoney, you better get these brakes fixed, or you're going to kill somebody. So he went on and made the tour, and coming back in on Dickerson Road out here, and Stoney was driving the bus. And somebody did one of those switcheroos in the front of Stoney, of, uh, Stoney and, and immediately put on their brakes and their left blinker. Well, Stoney couldn't pull over around him, so he smacked him. And this guy got out of the car, giving it this, you know, and Hawk got out of the bus, and he said, I told you, Stoney, you were going to kill somebody if you didn't fix them sorry brakes. I want to make sure he gets to talk, though, yeah. and I want to make sure he That's gets to do his part. Play. <laughs> I know he don't. No, if you got a story, it. share it. with Well, us. Um, he knows this, and he knows I have loved him from day one. Well, let me tell you well, what she did to me one time when I was when I was a kid. I was probably twelve years old. I was just oh God, Skeeter Davis. Well, I, I seen her backstage at the Opera one time. This is when Opera Land was open, and um, me and Skeeter made a date to go out and ride the new roller coaster there at Opry Land. Well, the next day I got up that morning, I got all, put my smell good on. Right before I was fixing to leave, Skeeter calls, Hawk, I, I'm not going to be able to make it. Just ripped my heart right out of my chest. Never, never forgave her for that yet. Well, did you go I home always, and write a sad song? No, well, I was only 12. All the kids loved me. You know, it was just all the kids loved me. And I loved all them, like, um, like Earl, like Robin and his brother. Because she and would buy us popcorn stuff at the Opry. When Dad wouldn't. would take us to the Opry. <laughs> and we said, hey, can we get a Coke and popcorn? <laughs> no, nah, boy, you can't get nothing. Sit down over there. <laughs> and when he'd go out and do his part, he'd ask Skeeter to watch us. And <laughs> as soon as Dad would hit st stage, Skeeter would say, come on, let's go get some cotton candy and popcorn <laughs> and Cokes and stuff. So we loved her. Uh, but the, the story that it's um, the night that uh, Betty Jack and I worked in Wheeling. We, we loved Hawk Show so much, but Hawk knew we were such big fans, and we met him in uh, Wheeling then, and uh, we were both so nervous and so excited and everything, and, and he saw our nervousness. So he came over and he gave us each a silver dollar to, uh, to twist and hang on to and everything. 
And uh, so then that night when we were fixing to leave, we had recorded our, you know, we just had I Forgot More. And he had just had a, a new session, and he said, I'll sing you girls my new songs that's coming out. And uh, so he did. He detained us. And then uh, we were told not to record, I mean, not to sing the one we would have coming out after I Forgot More. Bajak said, we'll sing you the one we got coming out after this one. I was always happy we did later because it was the only time we re she really got to sing it because um, uh, we had that fateful accident that night and took her life. The next time I saw your daddy, he was just filled with guilt and he had tears because he always felt that he had detained us and he was dealing with if I hadn't stopped you and if we hadn't had those times, you wouldn't have had that accident. He was thinking all these feelings and I was always so glad I got to see him. He said, but I've got something for you. I said, that wasn't ever your fault. You gave us, that probably made her the happiest of anything that could have ever happened before she died was to have that time in that dressing room and you singing to us, that had to be so special. And he said, well, I've got something for you. I don't know which one was hers and which one was yours because we'd given him back the silver dollars when we left that night and because they were special to him, that's what he told us. So he said, uh, but I want to give you one of them. And I told him, I keep saying, there's going to be the time when I want to turn it over. And I was telling Carol Lee this in the dressing room a while ago. I guess maybe it's my age or the illness or whatever. But I've got little things. I've got something for Dean. I've got something for you. And I'm going to give you that silver dollar. Oh, I didn't bring no. it today, but you're going to get that silver dollar. Oh, I have it. And Bless I wrote on there, heart. Hawk, in 1953, you know, in 1955 heart, when he gave it to me. Your yeah. sweetheart. That's he beautiful. knows I love him, though. Right. You know, it's ironic, too, Hawk, that, um, that your dad's biggest hit came and About the time you were born, uh, yeah, after the week after the week after he died, it went number one, stayed number one for four weeks. And it's a, a country music a like first, classic, yeah. written by our friend Justin Tubb. Lay a little bit of it on us. Okay, then I can tell my fair and young story. <laughs> Had our number changed today, although I hate it too. But each time the phone would ring, they'd want to speak to you. And it hurts to tell them you're not here with me. Maybe now, old telephone will let me be. It's not in the book now, so you'd better write it down. Just in case your love for me should ever come around You might want to call and bring the news to me Just call Lonesome 77203 I keep the telephone beside me all the time Hoping that you might want to call and say you change your mind If you do then darling you know where I'll be I'm at Lonesome 77203 just call Lonesome 77203. Thank you, guys. Thank y'all. Appreciate that. And then he would say, he'd lean into the microphone and he'd say, and don't say anything to your enemies that you don't want your friends to know. He's, he used to sign off his shows at the Opry. Right? Right. Oh, you didn't knew, know that? Never knew that. Oh, yeah. yeah That's yeah, something that was, new. Yeah, well, he said that many times. What's your What's your Farron Young story? Oh, I was, like I said, I was a kid, and um, Farron would walk by the dressing rooms there at the Opry, and uh, Farron was there, I guess he'd been doing the curls a little bit, and uh, he's, young Hulk, come in here, come in here. Mom grabbed me by the arm, pulled me out of Farron's. <coughs> Farron's um, dressing room wouldn't let me go in. I was like, oh, come on, Mom, come on, Mom. She wouldn't let me go in that dressing room for nothing. <laughs> well, you know, I was just down in West Palm Beach with Bill and Jim Ed and everybody. We were down there playing the fair, and your mama was down there, and now his mama can hold her own with Farron Young. Oh, yeah. She always oh, yeah. could. <laughs> and we, in between shows, we went out to the car because there was no place to sit at the show, so we went out, me and my wife went out and sat in the car, and 
Gene Shepard and Benny were both sitting out there in the van right next to us. So we rolled down the windows and got to talking. And she said, Robin, you're going to go uh, do this taping here on Friday. I said, yeah. And she said, well, Hawk's going to be there. Little Hawk's going to be over there. And you're going to get to meet him and everything. Y'all are headed off real well. And I said, oh, good. I've been wanting to meet him. And she goes, and tell him if he doesn't act right, I'm going to whip his butt. <laughs> and I, I said, Jeannie, if he's your kid, he knows all about butt whipping already. He already <laughs> knows. Yes. You know, it's really great. Um, a lot of these guys, Ronnie and Robin and Dean, we, I've, I've never met these guys, and it's, it's really an honor to get to meet these guys. Bill, do you, uh, do you notice the similarity of the vibrato and the tone of voice that each one of these yes. guys yeah. has? Every Man, everyone. I tell you what, we was having chills a while ago when he was singing because I can remember, uh, you know, I was a, a real good friend of Hawks, and uh, we... Uh, I used to go over when he was working out them white horses that he had over there on Maplewood Lane. In fact, I, you know, he handed me his airline ticket uh, when he said, here, kid, you be Hawkshaw Hawkins on that 6 o'clock plane. He gave me his open airline ticket to get back to Nashville, and he took my place on that fatal plane crash that he had. But that each one of these guys, uh, you can just hear so much of their father in them. Uh, and I know that they're not trying to sing like their father. It's just the natural genes that they have. I was going to say, too, what I've, what, knowing him so well and loving him so much, too, through the years from the time I pat you in your mama's belly when I came to her when your father died. I mean, you know, um, the pain, I think, too, sometimes that maybe we don't touch on. I felt a lot of love and concern, too, because of the popularity of Patsy and the, uh, and the giant uh, figure that she became. Uh, it's like Hawk was so, you know, uh, overlooked or not mentioned. You know, it's always the plane crash that killed Patsy. And, and I've, I just want you to know that I've thought of y'all so much because of that, too, that, that you've lived with that all through these years. And, and your daddy, who was so great and who was so loved and was just so important to so many people, and it's just so great to see well, you. And I hope imagine Kathy Cope, she lost a husband. Yes, and, and that's father. what I meant. So, and a, you know, and a father, a, a husband and a father. Oh, you're right. I just want you to know there's a lot of people that I talk to that share that love and, and that pain and that thought of that for you. And don't ever underestimate how wonderful and how, how much your daddy's loved. You, Bill, yeah. you know when George sings about who's going to fill their shoes? They ain't going to pinch none of these kids' feet, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Mighty good talent in this you're room. Right. Let me say something here. You know, we look around us here, and uh, we have an awful lot of youngsters here that uh, we look at them, and not only do they look like their fathers, but they sound like their fathers and their mothers. Uh, and it, 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 it kind of reminds me, reminds me of a story. When I was a small child down, in, uh, down, in, down around Sparkman, Arkansas, you know, Sparkman was a very small town, and they, uh, they didn't have money enough to pay, you know, for street lights and those things. And, of course, back then, they didn't have too many of them anyway. But uh, on special days like Christmas and Thanksgiving and all, they would all hang out lanterns. And uh, in the evening, this gentleman... He would come along, and he would light those lights. And the darker it got, the further it got, but you could always tell where he had been. Their father has left quite a legacy because they're gone, but the shadow is there, but the lights are still burning. You bet. Absolutely. Aren't you a philosopher? <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, the old lamp lighter. Are you plugging oh, the old lamp lighter? He'll do anything. Plug us on. Won't he? I really <laughs> the kick in the anyway. Michael, well, I think you're the only one statement. here uh, of the youngins that's only sung one song. You did "Hello, Darling" back earlier. I, I think we need another Conway another. song. You reckon? I think we do. <laughs> let, let me ask you about the uh, the necklace that you're wearing. Now, I've seen your dad. It's the C and, and, and the T there. Maybe they can get a close-up uh, on it with the camera there. Is that his? Is that the one that he wore? This, well, there's only two of them in existence. The original was made for Dad by Jimmy J, who we were talking about earlier. Dad used to run United Talent, the uh, book that I used to get Dad and Loretta Lynn had together. 
that Jimmy J gave to Dad and uh, was made by a jeweler out here in in, uh, in north of Nashville. But uh, after my dad passed away, uh, it was in the estate, and the exec I got the executor. You know, first I, I, of course I wanted it. Well, because of different things we won't go into now, I, I couldn't get it. One, one of them can, can of worms. <laughs> but anyway, the executor, uh, Sonny Carden, went down with me to the jeweler, jewelers and uh, took a cast from it and had this one made from it. And it's exactly the same, the chain and, and everything. The original, uh, my, my dad's widow has. Uh, she bought it in the estate sale. But uh, this is just like it, and I keep it close to my heart every, everywhere I go. I never saw him without his, and I think it's great that, uh, that you're wearing it. Do one of his yeah. great songs. All right, I think I'll, I think I'll do one. Uh, you know, Dad was known for every once in a while he would write and or record songs that were how you say risque <laughs> on the on the cutting edge uh, eh, dirty <laughs> no, no he would never say done dirty yes. Dude. Yes. <laughs> this was one that came out in 1973 when we were doing the uh, Mr. Anderson Bill we were doing the uh, softball thing you know uh, for muscular dystrophy out in Oklahoma City and everybody walked around in big buttons I don't know if you remember had let's boom 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 with Conway Twitty <laughs> And this is one everybody can jump in there too at the right moment and help help me out on it, okay? <laughs> I can almost hear the stillness as it yields to the sound of your heart beating. Bum, 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 yeah. And I can almost hear the echo of the thoughts that I know you must be thinking. Bum, bum, bum. And I can feel your body tremble As you wonder what this moment holds in store bum, bum, bum. And as I put my arms around you I can tell you've never been this far before bum, bum, bum. I don't know what I'm saying As my trembling fingers touch Forbidden places Bum, bum, bum I only know I've waited For so long For this chance that we are taking Bum, bum, bum Well, I don't know and I don't care What made you tell him you don't love him anymore Bum, bum, bum as I taste your tender kisses, I can tell you've never been this far before. Bum, bum, bum. Yes, and as I take the love you're giving, I can feel the tension building in your mind. Uh -huh. And you're wondering if tomorrow I'll still love you like I'm loving you tonight. But tonight will only make me love you more Bum, bum, bum And girl, I hope that you'll believe me Cause I know you've never been this far before Bum, bum, bum Lord, bum, bum, bum Thank you, buddy, darling <laughs> Right after your dad wrote that song, he called me. I, my office was across the hall from United uh, Talent yeah, in those days. Right. And he called me over late one afternoon. He said, I want to sing you a new song I've written. And he sat there just him and the guitar. And he did the bom, 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 you know. And when he got through, I said, that's really good. I said, now the bom, 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 that's where the music's going to play, right? And he said, no, I'm going to sing bom, bom, bom. <laughs> and I went out of there scratching my head thinking he's lost his mind. <laughs> what is he talking about? But he knew, I mean, he had the vision for that song. Exactly. You know, a lot of people don't think of him. Mean, everybody, of course, here knows it. That, that a, lot, a lot of people in, uh, in the audience don't know that Conway Twitty was, a, of course, everybody knows he's a great singer and everything, but he was a great songwriter. Uh -huh. And, you know, he always said it's that song, you know, it's that song that makes a singer. And we were talking about a while ago, I'd listen to two or three thousand songs, you know, just to get down to ten. But he really, he said, it ain't, it ain't me, it's that song, you know. I said, well, Dad, I believe I'd give you just a little taste of credit in there, you know. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> I mean, he, he had so much soul. My, man was such, my dad was such a soulful man. Uh, 
uh, I used to tell him, I said, Dad, you know, you can get more feeling and soul out of one word than, than a lot of singers I've listened to can out of a whole song. And uh, I think it's because he was such a great person. My dad really was one of the finest human beings. That I, you know, I get asked all the time, you know, what's it, I'm sure everybody here can, what's it like to be Conway Twitty's son? What's it like to be Fair and Young's son? What's it like, you know, you heard that, uh, and Ronnie and everybody has, but uh, I've always answered it this way. I say, well, you know, as proud as I am of what my dad's done in this industry, and God knows he's, he's set a lot of records, you know, more number one records than anybody in history of music in 55, and uh, I could go on and on and on, you know, talking about it. But as proud as I am of all that, um, I'm ten times more proud to be the son of Harold Jenkins, a man, because he is one of the finest human beings I ever knew in my life, and I'm very proud to be uh, his son. If I, if I can be half the man he was, I'll be doing all right. The, the thought comes to me that I know there's an awful lot of technology these days, and a lot, a lot of things going on in the music industry. But I feel we have lived in the very best time, Amen. the very best time of this industry and of this world. I really feel that way, and I, I don't know whether anybody shares that or not, but I think that the music industry as we have known it, the, the performers being so available to the fans and the friendship among people that have gathered like we are gathered today, tell me that we have certainly had something special and shared that with one another. And the world. And the world. And the world. Yes. Bill, um, uh, Harold, uh, I think this would be great for the fans to know because I know it happened uh, just last year. Didn't they uh, put a, a monument now? Yeah, they put and a monument I think the fans in, might like to know this. Down because in Camden, Tennessee, yeah. where the, the site of the plane crash, they, they put a monument down there and uh, dedicated it and... Kathy came and um, Randy and all of them came down and we did the county fair down there and it's a pretty neat place. You Finally, still, they have a place now where the fans can come yeah, and can talk go. about it. There's a mailbox where you can leave your name and I guess you'll get a thank you card and everything and it's it's pretty neat where the, the has anybody here ever seen the site where it happened? There's there's a there's a big tall tree and right at the base of it there's a, a hole in the ground about as big around as maybe two of these chairs. And it's just you walk in the woods right there where it's happening. It's just, it's spooky. I mean, I, I got goosebumps now just thinking about it. It's, the hole was caused by the where yes, the yes, that's where they brought the It was about the uh, six or eight foot deep, wasn't it? Well, now it's not. Well, it's full of leaves now, yeah. so mm -hmm. it's, it's probably four foot deep. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody supposed to be on that plane? Yes. Yeah. He told me. yeah anyway, I thought it'd be nice to know that there is that monument. I knew it just happened just uh, last year, uh, right? Last two two years ago. It'd be th be three years ago this July. That's great. It's nice to know that it's there. Kitty, yeah. Wells, Kitty Wells came down and Johnny. And, and, uh, that's the first time um, I guess I was ever on TV I, for a split second. They didn't interview me or nothing, but I was standing there next to Mom. I was looking good. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, Bill, talking about the monuments, uh, my, my father, when he passed away, in his will, he wanted to be cremated, and he wanted his ashes spread in Old Hickory Lake, where he lived and loved out there. So we... Uh, Merle got hold of Johnny Cash and asked Johnny if we could go out to his place and spread the ashes from off the cliffs out there. And he, Johnny, took care and accommodated us on it. It was all first class. And uh, that's one thing that I've had people say, you know, well, I'm coming to Nashville. I want to visit your father's grave. And I said, he doesn't have one. You know, there's no marker. There's no headstone for Fair and Young. And to me, one of these days when the CMA wises up and they put him in the Country Music Hall of Fame, that's going to be his headstone, that bronze plaque in there and that's the the day i'm living for that's what i want to say that will be farron young's monument well he certainly belongs in the country music hall of fame amen he certainly so does conway does. twitty absolutely yeah, conway yeah, twitty does you're talking about 55 number one records yeah he certainly does this has been great sharing this with uh, with dean miller and with robin young and uh, hawkshaw hawkins jr rex allen jr ronnie robbins jet williams georgette jones these boys here, that I know their daddy would be proud of them if he was here. You've seen a lot of them come and go, Mr. Carlisle. Yes, Carlin. I have. Yeah. What kind so, of words of advice have you got? To... Well, uh, I, I, my advice would be be ready when the time comes for you to go so you'll know where so. you're going. <laughs> And I know where I'm going to meet my wife and my daughter, my mother and father. 
brothers go. and sisters. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Dell, we need to leave on a happy note. If anybody well, can pick I us up. Tell, and... I can't test one, two, three, four. <laughs> Hello there. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Good night, everybody. No. <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell none of the stories today on uh, the great Roger Miller that we did so many shows together across the country. I just couldn't get into those stories. And also, uh, Marty sold me the, his bus after he had his first heart attack, you know, things, uh, things like that I could have told, but I just, I, I'd rather sit and listen to these kids tell their stories about these people that I have run around with and messed around with. I didn't know they were so damn good. <laughs> we got to wait until the statute of limitations it's great. runs out. <laughs> and to leave, well, leave us with a song, Dale. And leave you with this. Uh, all right. I'm on a little fast, little fire, die young, and leave a beautiful memory. I want a little fast, little fire, die young, and leave a beautiful memory. I'm a wampus cat, let me grab my hat, and baby, come along with me. I want to leave a lot of hybrids happen, they really going on a spree. I want a little fast, little fire, die young, and leave a beautiful memory. Well, you may not approve of the things I do, but it really don't bother me. Ain't nobody gonna tie me down. I'm gonna stay foot loose and fancy free. So jump back, make tracks, move out, and let the pretty girls at me. I want to live fast, love hard, die young, and leave a beautiful memory. I want to live fast, love hard, die young, and leave a beautiful memory. Do, 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 do.